Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome to my review of Fifty Shades Freed by Erica Leonard, aka Erica Mitchell, aka E.L. James. You know, when I started my review of Fifty Shades of Grey, I was tempted to refuse to use her pen name because pen names are for real authors, but I decided I had no time to be petty when there was actual serious issues to talk about. Just in case you skimmed the title of this video, might I warn my beautiful watchers that the subject of abuse, both physical and emotional, will be brought up in this review. If you've had personal experience with these things, please bear that in mind before watching it. Also, please be advised that the comments section will be policed as much as humanly possible and any disrespect towards this subject and the real-life people it has hurt will be punished with the crushing fury of the proverbial banhammer. While I will be providing some context for my complaints here, you will almost certainly be a little lost if you're not familiar with this book. As I would never recommend reading it, not even to my most hated nemesis, if you need some background information, please instead avail yourself to the helpful, if somewhat sarcastic, plot synopsis video that I made for your convenience. If left entirely to my own devices, I probably wouldn't consider this worth mentioning at this point, but Every time I fail to do so in a video like this, people try to explain it to me on the slightly patronizing assumption that I've somehow managed to miss this little detail until now. Fifty Shades started its existence as an online, overly sexual Twilight fanfiction under the seemingly random name Masters of the Universe. The name and enough details to avoid copyright issues were changed later when it was published as a book, but you can constantly see where it was inspired by certain Twilight characters and plot points. Or at least I'm told you can if you've actually read Rebecca Meyer's books. I have not which is why I don't reference them in my reviews. I think I have enough beef with this series that I don't really need to bring up the plagiarism, you feel me? Now, don't misunderstand me, I medically require a year between reading these books to preserve my mind and body, but it does have some disadvantages. Namely, it's just long enough that I manage to repress all the worst parts of the books and end up being horrified by them all over again. What I'm trying to say is I'm probably going to end up repeating a lot of the complaints I made in the reviews of the last two books, but I just can't let this shit go. Apologies if you've recently rewatched the backlog in preparation for this. <clears throat> James still only knows a limited number of descriptives. Words are repeated over and over again, sometimes in the same sentence. The murmuring is the worst. <sighs> okay, that's technically not true. I think whispering is repeated more often, but I couldn't stop noticing the fucking murmuring. Everyone was just murmuring and murmuring and murmuring and murmuring and murmuring and murmuring and murmuring. And I mean everyone, not just Gray and Anna. A police detective comes to interview Anna about the attempted assault on her, and he fucking murmurs too. Learn more words, James, for God's sake! She also needs to learn the correct meaning of the words that she does know because she's still using the word subconscious to mean conscience. And while we're on that subject, the level of detail that goes into what Anna's subconscious and inner goddess are doing at any given moment was always slightly disturbing, but now it's gotten to the point where I am fully convinced that Anna can actually see these people. They are definitely not metaphors. You don't describe a metaphor sunbathing herself on the deck of a ship or reading the complete works of Charles Dickens. I'm telling you, this is no longer a clumsily miswritten shoulder angel and devil situation. It's vivid hallucinations that need to be reported to a medical professional as soon as possible. Anna still comes at the drop of a hat, disguising how limited Grey's sexual stamina actually is, and her orgasms are still always described as her dissolving in some way or another. It's basically the same copy-paste sentences every time, with a few words quickly run through thesaurus.com. James continues to mention exactly what music is playing at any and all given moments in the story. I've learned that this is something that you often come across in fanfiction and other amateur writing, because the author wants to convey a certain tone or mood, but doesn't quite understand that using music isn't a viable option for doing that in a book, because it doesn't work that way, plus not everyone will have heard the song you want them to imagine. Grey still orders Anastasia to eat all the time. He's obsessed with her under-eating in his opinion and constantly comments on her weight until she starts to feel really insecure and paranoid about it. Oh hey. First one of these of the episode. E.L. James flip-flops on the subject of Grey's BDSM for a third time, abandoning the middle book's plot that Grey is aware that he's not really a dominant and his need to punish brown-haired girls is a manifestation of his baggage towards his late mother that will hopefully evaporate once Anna is done fixing him, and returns to the first book's plot that he is in fact a capable dominant and Anna will enjoy her time with him if she gets into it. I do believe I've cited enough examples over the course of reviewing this book series to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt 
out that Grey is the least qualified person in the universe to be involved in BDSM. As you may remember, the book starts with another attempt to make you feel sad for Grey by telling, from his perspective, how he sat with his mother's body for hours after she died before the police showed up. This utterly fails to invoke the intended emotional reaction for a number of reasons. First of all, it's just a really badly written scene, even by James's usual standards, and that is saying a lot. Second, there is nothing on this beautiful blue planet of ours that would make me feel anything but hatred for Grey at this point. No amount of sad backstory can make up for the shit that he has pulled in these books. And third, a little writing tip, James. If you want us to take a character seriously and feel anything about her death, do not exclusively and relentlessly refer to her as the crack whore for three books. I know being surprised about this is a sign of insanity on my part because this relationship of theirs has been nothing but constant fighting since day one and expecting that to change now is ludicrous, but... Even knowing that, I just can't believe that Grey would make such a huge deal out of Anna not wanting to say she'll obey him in their wedding vows. Now hear me out, I thought the whole supposed reason that Grey wanted to marry Anna instead of any of his other subs was because she did in fact disobey him and that helped break down his barriers and learn to accept touching and shit. Now don't get me wrong, I have never believed for a second that Grey was actually improving and wanted Anna to be anything other than his demure mother looking like sex slave, I'm just shocked that James would write in such a blatant contradiction to all the character growth she claimed he was making. The first couple of chapters of this book are really fucking confusing because there's so many flashbacks, and said flashbacks are so long, sometimes the chapter feels like it's more past than present. There is no reason this book couldn't have started with the wedding and told this part of the story sequentially. Nothing is gained by suddenly switching the writing style to mimic an episode of Lost just at the start and end of the book. Anastasia starts this third installment of the story completely broken. She was always a wet paper towel of a person, but what little will that she did have is gone. Grey has her fully convinced that every vile thing he does is either excusable by his sad childhood, or in some way her fault for provoking it. He humiliated her in public and was horrible to her on their honeymoon? Well, she shouldn't have disobeyed his instructions to remain fully dressed on the beach, no one to blame but herself. He ruined her fun night out with Kate with his threats and uncontrollable anger? Well, she shouldn't have been out with Kate, he told her to drink with her at home where they belong. Anna has to seek forgiveness from Grey for non-crime so many times, she even thanks him for not being angry at her for no reason. The gaslighting is complete, she is a husk now. Sometimes this book gives off little hints of awareness that there really is something deeply, deeply wrong with Anna and Grey's relationship. Things like an outsider taking issue with things that Anna has come to accept as normal, like Grey's selfish controlling behaviour, she immediately tries to dismiss their concerns because, well, they just don't fully understand Christian, which is 100% the first reaction of someone who is in denial about being in a toxic relationship. Please take note of that, I know it's super easy to dismiss an outside perspective because you think they don't have the full story, but the flip side is they can often see things much clearer because they're not directly involved in it. Don't let someone train you to ignore people who might be able to help you. There's also a ton of Freudian slips in Anna's internal monologue. When she rides the jet ski to the shore in France, she mentions she finally feels free, and what do you know, that also happens to be the first time in the book that she's been away from Grey. In a similar vein, she says she's relaxed for the first time in months when she's away from him and out drinking with Kate, which of course doesn't last very long because he reinserts himself into that evening from across the world. There's also an occasion in France where she buys a very cheap piece of jewellery and says something akin to, now this is more me, which I think was supposed to be a very ham-fisted way of saying that money isn't changing Anna, but it also implies that she hates the incredibly expensive bracelet that Grey insisted on buying for her slightly earlier in the chapter. FYI, he bought that bracelet to cover up the marks left by the handcuffs that he used to restrain her while he marked her chest. Dude clearly believes he can buy forgiveness for his behaviour. And of course there's the fact that on several occasions Anna is able to perfectly vocalise what she wants to say to Grey in her head, but feels she can't do so out loud for fear of his reaction. The closest she can ever get to being frank with him is via email, because he can't physically intimidate her over the internet. I'm inclined to believe that these things were entirely unintentional and merely the result of incompetent writing. This is mainly because James seems to be really leaning into her personal narrative that she's a misunderstood 
genius and there's no abuse in her books whatsoever. The other option being that this was intentional, but we're supposed to assume that it's all over and done with by the time of the epilogue, as Anna has finished healing Grey of all his trauma and damage. However, if that was the case, you have to imagine that Anna would show some awareness that this stuff isn't right instead of desperately trying to justify it to herself all the time. In general, Grey still acts like he's expecting Anna to give up on her autonomy and be his slave any day now. In fact, despite everything he's promised to the contrary, he seems to be under the impression that it's long overdue. He still insists that Anna defying him is unacceptable and something he's justified in being enraged about, he still punishes her when he's angry at her, and he still sees no issues with keeping tabs on her whereabouts 24-7. I remind you that this is supposed to be the improved Chrissy boy. Anna has supposedly been fixing him so well, his high-end psychiatrist is in awe of her success, but there is zero recognisable difference in the character. He just doesn't understand that she has the right to free will and doesn't have to run her every choice by him for approval. That possibility just doesn't exist in his mind zone, so from his perspective, she is behaving unacceptably when she goes out for a drink with a friend. Grey's empathy remains effectively non-existent. He just cannot conceive that Anna has a life beyond him, or that she has feelings of her own that don't relate to him in some way. Claiming he can live without the contract in book one, saying he wants a regular relationship free of punishment with her in book two? Meaningless. Empty, hollow promises. He continues treating her as if he's living in some sort of alternative reality, where she signed the contract right up until the end of the last book. On top of that, there's numerous small acts of selfishness that consistently show that Grey gives zero craps about anything but his own happiness. Just as an example, he refuses to let Anna take off her wedding dress after the ceremony because he wants to undress her, and he wants to do it later, so she has to travel in it. I've never personally worn a wedding dress, but I must confess they don't look overly comfortable. He prioritises the minor pleasure he'll get out of undressing her later over his bride's wishes and needs. I know that seems small and unimportant, but like I said, it's just an example. That sort of thing is constantly popping up throughout the book. Of the many, many, many things that just happen in the story with no real contribution to the plot, one of the most pointless is a fake-out in regards to Elliot possibly cheating on Kate. That's Grey's little brother and Anna's best friend, in case you've forgotten, and I wouldn't blame you for having done so. Gia, the sexy architect that Anna bullies, apparently had some sort of history with Elliot. They worked together and hooked up once, apparently. While in Aspen, Anna sees Elliot out in town with Gia when he said he was going fishing. She wonders if he's cheating on her best friend and deliberates on telling her about it. Later, when Elliot proposes to Kate, Anna assumes that he isn't, but wonders if he was tactless enough to enlist the help of a former lover in buying a ring. She finds out later that, no, he just happened to see Gia and Aspen completely coincidentally, said hi for that one moment that she saw, then they went their separate ways. That's it. That's what that entire subplot boiled down to. Are you cheating on Kate? No. Good. Freed, like Grey and Darker before it, at best excuses and at worst conflates obsessive jealous controlling behaviour with being protective. Grey sometimes has reason to fear for Anna's safety, and sometimes doesn't, but either way expects to have complete control over her actions at all times. Whether it's where she goes, how she gets there, who she spends time with, or exactly what she does, he expects her to check with him first and obey his decision on the matter, and is furious if that's not complied to. And don't even get me started on the bodyguard he hires to protect her, the people who report her every movement back to him and have a list of people she is and is not allowed to see. The people who, if they obey any instructions or requests from Anna without getting his approval first, are fired on the spot. Those aren't bodyguards, they're jailers. Grey hired a group of men and women to stop Anna from escaping his control for even a second. Anna, of course, brushes off this behaviour as if it were an irritating but excusable personality quirk, no matter how invasive it becomes to her everyday life. When Anna has a feeling of dread on her wedding day, proving she was apparently still slightly sane at that point, Kate encouragingly tells her that she's seen how happy Grey has made her over the last few months. Kate. Seriously. The same Kate who originally tried to advise Anna against going on a date with Grey because he gave her red flag vibes. The same Kate who saw Anna reduced to uncontrollable tears when Grey was punishing her, then immediately leaving. The same Kate who was living with Anna when she and Grey broke up for three days and that somehow made her such an emotional wreck it caused massive changes to her body. The same Kate who tried to tell Grey to keep away from Anna because of the terrible effect he was having on her. That same Kate is now talking about how happy Grey has made her. Is 
Is James retconning the past two books, or is she just assuming we're as forgetful of past events as she is? The fighting in this relationship is just too much. These people fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. They have been bickering and shouting and arguing since the day they got together and have never gone more than a day without it since. Anna has the gall to say something akin to, well, yes, the honeymoon was a little hard to get through, but I'm pretty sure that's the same with all couples, right? Anna. The honeymoon period is a byword for the start of a relationship where everything is going super well because you're so into each other and excited nothing seems like a problem. You are figuratively saying, well, the super fun awesome time sucked, but that's perfectly normal, right? Anna thinks that her marriage is okay because even though they argue all the time and he treats her like shit, at the end of the day they have what she believes is good sex. How was this character written to be this unaware of how healthy relationships are supposed to work? The really, really scary thing about Grey marking Anna's chest with hickeys so that she couldn't sunbathe anymore is that he did it after they had already agreed not to argue about it anymore and he had calmed down. I mean, it would still be an inexcusable act, but I'm pretty sure I would find it less disturbing if he had done it in a fit of rage. But no. It was a calculated act. He thought about how he could get his own way and initiated sex with her with the intention of marking her flesh without her knowledge or consent because he just couldn't stand the idea of other men seeing her. That's just evil. There's no other word for it. That's an evil act that requires there to be a darkness within you to even contemplate. I know it's all fiction, but I think the fact that there were no consequences for Grey for this will haunt me for years. Ownership plays a never-ending and increasingly offensive role in this romance. Grey really steps up how often he says, you are mine, to Anna. He uses it for every occasion, when he's happy, when he's ordering her not to do something, or when he's angry. He's not even trying to hide the fact that he's not speaking figuratively when he says this anymore. I know that saying that sort of thing can be used in a cute context, but this sure as fuck isn't it. Grey proves again and again that he actually believes that Anna is his property. He says as much when he calls her an asset. It is so horrible to read. Every single woman in this book is instantly enamored with Grey on sight and slightly hostile towards Anna because of it. Every single one. No person of the female persuasion can bear to look away from his angelic face or able to do their job correctly when distracted by his vistage. Once again, there are two possible options here and neither are good. Either James cannot conceive of a woman who isn't obsessed of looks or can keep their shit together when presented with a good-looking man, or Anna has become so jealous and insecure she is now an unreliable narrator and is projecting homewrecker intentions onto these women simply because they dared to exist in the same location as her husband. I mentioned how there were a few non-relatable leaps in Anna's logic when she brought Grey a camera specifically to take nudes of her, but at least it was coming from a good place, an attempt to do something nice. Guess what? He makes it creepy. When Anna uploads the SD card, she finds out that Grey took hundreds of photos of her while she was sleeping and never mentioned it. I know I don't have to explain why that isn't okay to you guys, but apparently someone needs to do it for him. There really is nothing that this character can't take and make less consensual. Anna even sees one of her sucking her thumb in her sleep. Grey saw his sexual partner sucking her thumb and thought, oh yeah, gonna need a picture of that for later. But of course Anna's like, well that's a a bit weird, but on with my day. Doo -dee -doo -dee -doo. In exactly the same way that James keeps trying to tell us in the dialogue that Grey's becoming a better person without it being reflected in his actual behaviour, so too does Anna's internal monologue keep insisting that she's becoming a strong independent woman while still letting every single person in her life walk all over her. Alright, after just a few weeks of marriage I've become a super assertive badass who takes no crap from anyone, thus proving my relationship is a positive influence on my life. Dream husband, I'll see you after drinks of Kate. No, I don't want you going out tonight. Drink at home. Okay. I guess we're staying in tonight. <laughs> no, I booked us a table. Come on. Okay. I have to assume that the issues with Grey's behaviour when he came to Anna's place of work to be vile towards her for not immediately changing her email to reflect his last name are so obvious they're not even worth dwelling on here. But just... Wow, you know, most authors couldn't create a character this insecure and horrible if they tried. If James could just admit to herself that she's one of the world's worst published authors and everything she thinks is romantic is actually abuse, then she could become like... 
one of the world's most sought after writing consultants when it comes to creating villains. Every single film she worked on would have a Ramsey Bolton or Count Olaf level hate sink in it. Okay, this seems like it would be a good spot to take a break and maybe a few medicinal shots of whiskey. We'll reconvene in a week to resume my descent into madness. As I, unlike James, have no desire to profiteer from anything even remotely connected to the glorification of abuse, as with all previous reviews in this series, I will be giving away the ad revenue that these videos make. This time around, I've decided to do it indefinitely, and it's going monthly to the National Domestic Violence Hotline. I've been informed that in 2018 they received a record amount of calls from people seeking help, and the numbers are only going up this year. If you'd like to make a donation as well, the link will be in the video description. I'm sure it would be much appreciated. If you can't afford to, fear not. Spreading this video around the internet will mean more money for them, and you know, will make me more popular and that's always nice. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Don't forget to top up my shield against the dark horror of the YouTube algorithm by liking, commenting, and subscribing, and I will hopefully see you soon if the second half of this review doesn't cause me to walk out into the Californian desert and live forever as a hermit. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the dom, I can't do that, for you see, I am of the Fremen, and we use water as currency here on Arrakis. I mean, you can have some if you really want, but I'm not sure how much use you're going to get out of it. Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode. Hello, my beautiful watchers, and welcome to <coughs> me coughing. Thought you could get me, didn't you, microphone? But not today. On with my day. Do -de -do -de -do. How was that? Kaluna's Gargoyles DVD just threw itself off the bookshelf. It's like, I can't take hearing about Fifty Shades of Grey anymore! The end! Damn kids and your skateboards. I say that unironically. Grey has her fully convinced that every vile thing he does is either excusable by his sad childhood or in some way her fault for provoke for provoking it. Oh, why do I write these scripts like this? Ah, la. Oh, that is so red. I need to, I need to lay off the cough, cough drops. The other option is that this was included intentionally, but we're supposed to assume that it's all done and over with by the time of the epilogue, as Anna has totally fixed it. Gri <laughs> well, that happened. In general, Grey still acts like he's expecting Anna to give up on her anonymity. Anonymity? 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 Anonymity. 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 Nope. Anna. Anna. Nimity. Nimity. Anna. Anna. Nimity. Nimity. Nope. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Anna. Anna. Nimity. Nimity. Anna. Anna. Nimity. 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 Anonymity. Thank you. In general, Grey still acts like he's expecting Anna to give up on her anonymity and he... Anon... Babe! Anonymity. Thank you!